we can we can light this fire. Yeah. Um, everybody to start. All right. Mics are live. Three, two, one. All right. Um, calling the special work session of the Emory School Board to order on uh, July 28th. Uh, can I have a motion on the approval of the agenda? Move to approve the agenda as presented. Second. Thank you, Ralph. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Right. Great. Uh, Karen, I'll turn it over to you and the team. All right. Very good. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm a little hoarse. I was cheering on Saturday for graduation. Don't have much voice left. So, um, I, if possible, could I have permission to show a presentation, Chris? You got it. To your screen. It's all yours. So, um, is it up? Yes. Okay, thank you. So, just to um, capture what um, I'm presenting to you all today, the presentation is in 2.01. However, it relates to all of the agenda items for one, two, and three. And for uh, the items on 2.01 and 2.02 .02 is for discussion and a vote for this evening. So of course we can move on with our reentry planning. And then on three, these are updates and things that we've done with tier three at this point. So you all know what we're going on, what's going on. And then um, for 2.04, I will excuse myself and you all will um, do your discussion around the search firm review. And Katie, it has not been discussed with me, but would you like COA, especially if they have to do tasks um, beyond you all selecting, but engaging with the firm, would you like for them to sit in on that meeting? Uh, yeah, that's fine. I mean, it's obviously not anything. Um, it's the discussion of, you know, a bid essentially. So um, nothing. Okay. Well, I'm sure they'd be happy to leave. They just want to make sure. I mean, I didn't, you know what I mean? Um, I just want to make sure that they're available and they're aware in any way to support. So I see you, Vince. I know he, his eyes lit up, didn't they? <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to go ahead and get us started. And... Share this. All right, everyone. So, hold on just a moment. Okay, that's not working. Okay, so as you can see, we have the delay start. I do wanna recognize uh, Maria, because this was a brainstorm that she had, I don't know how many meetings ago, maybe three meetings ago, <laughs> where we were rolling out the plan originally. And um, what we have now for you today is the background for how um, it would benefit the district and other items of consideration, like the technical aspect of how it will impact the calendar. So I um, have my team here to kind of give you the feedback on these main bullet points right now. So the first thing, uh, the rationale for adding five days is what we're looking at with a school start of September 1st, how that would benefit the staff and the family regarding training, especially since we're going all virtual now. Um, there's several considerations that we're specifically speaking to that particular need. So uh, Roxana, um, I would like for you to talk about the training piece and how that would benefit having a delay start. Right, so really our proposal is just to push the calendar back one week. We would not be adding contract days uh, for teachers per se, but what that does is it buys us a little bit of time to have uh, some of our work groups that have already been working finalize some tasks. So we have uh, some curriculum groups that need to meet 
in order to work on priority standards for the year and really look at adjusted scope and sequence and how that fits with a virtual calendar. We do have the uh, distance learning coaches that are meeting and we have been meeting and we will continue to meet, but it gives us a little more time to get very specific uh, it's learning training ready to be deployed during our back to school week for teachers. So every uh, building and consideration has slight nuances. And we wanna make sure we have that ready. Uh, we have staff members uh, in the building who are collecting information uh, for parents in terms of just basic things about that they might need to know about Chromebooks or um, some of the systems that specifically they would be uh, perhaps needing to assist their younger children with. So we do have uh, quite a few pieces there that uh, after talking with the principals and the teacher teams, um, we could just use an extra five days would help us be more prepared in terms of the training pieces that we want to have ready. Mm -hmm. And so um, continuing on here, talking about deployment of devices and systems, I would like to uh, direct your attention to Chris and he can give some background on that. Sure, so uh, we began, the middle school began checking out the devices to the seventh grade this week, um, actually last Friday. And those will be continuing. Their, their model is, they, as they schedule those virtual home visits with families, mm -hmm. step one after they've made their appointment is to come by the school and pick up their device. So that's working out fairly well for them. Uh, the Eighth grade and the rest of the high school starts, I believe, on August 10th. So those devices will start going out. And uh, we've been doing that for years. So that's, that's not really a, a change for us as far as getting those devices to our secondary students uh, in, a, in a relatively timely fashion. The elementary, our, our technology, our uh, instructional technology specialist, forgot the title for a second, is coming back online uh, tomorrow and he, and the rest of the tech team will work with the <clears throat> at the ECC and the elementary to, to strategize the deployment of those devices. Um, we do have a bit of a supply chain issue in full disclosure. While these devices were ordered months ago, um, we're, we're getting word from our distributor that the entire world is apparently looking for Chromebooks right now. And uh, even though we were in front of this, we got word yesterday, I believe it was, that we we're delayed until that first week of August at least. So, or excuse me, September. So, um, we are working to have a plan. We've got, we've got everybody accounted for except for one grade level. So, we are working to find a solution to that. And as soon as I come up with that, I will let you know. Uh, beyond that, we are tidying up the data for those that have the um, they have issues with their Wi-Fi, as in they may not have Wi-Fi at their homes. We're tidying up that data to make sure that we have good numbers and making the order for any of the additional hotspots that we need to make sure that those folks are covered. Uh, as far as the systems go, It's Learning has been archived for 2019-2020, and we are working to connect it to PowerSchool to make the new, make the new year, for, so 2020-2021. Um, now that power school and once power school and its learning are completely rolled over, we start rolling over all the rest of those systems. So that happens pretty fast and furious. And again, that's something that we do each year. So that's, um, that's nothing new to this situation. But I think what is new is we will be giving families a guaranteed all virtual option uh, for families that might want that for the semester. And so we're not really sure uh, that that survey, if you will, should go out this week along with a video explaining, you know, what that choice is. Um, depending on how many people sign up, we will have to spin all of that up and, and, and get everybody realigned. And so that takes some time too. Mm -hmm. Good point, Roxana. Thank you. And can we, is there at some point going to be a recapping for us about the different options for virtual? Um, feel like there's still a lot of big question marks and maybe oh. that's um, because of it's all happening so quickly here but um, is that part of tonight's presentation or could it, it be? It can be yeah of course. Yeah absolutely and then also to let you know what our process is that's the 
well, part of our process for educating the parents on their choice, we're kind of stepping it out. We have a kind of a webinar recorded program that explains and has a flow chart of how the different virtual choices are going to, um, to be, they can select which one and an explanation. That's gonna come from Roxana in the next couple of days by the end of the week. And within that email, there will be a Google form for them to select which one they would um, prefer for that. So of course, we're always available to clarify anything um, that questions that uh, parents may have regarding the choice. So that's forthcoming in terms of the family so they know um, which way to go with their choices and a better understanding of what they are. But yeah, um, just to finish this up right now with the whole calendar so we can keep, keep that train of thought together. Ed, can you kind of just talk about really what that means when we say pushback and the impact of that? And uh, I did not add returning teachers, what that date is. So if you could also let them know. Sure. Uh, the other attachment on this agenda item is uh, what I'll call a, just a mock-up. It's a prototype. It reflects only what Roxana touched on a few minutes ago. And that is, you know, the first day uh, back for teachers, which would be the 26th of August instead of the 19th. Um, first day of instruction would be September 1st. What the calendar does not reflect is I didn't change any, uh, you know, professional development days or early release or any of the semester markers, you know, end of semester, beginning of semester. I think that's going to have to be something that if we're going to go forward with this, uh, we're going to need to get the calendar committee convened. Um, I already uh, gave them kind of a warning shot this morning in an email just saying, hey, this is what we're considering tonight at tonight's board meeting. And here are some things I'd like you to think about as far as uh, whether we need to um, make any major alterations within um, the calendar year based on moving it back a month. So um, I think that's it. Any questions about the calendar? So there are no changes to the teacher contracts. Is that because essentially the teacher days, the instructional days pretty much stayed the same. They just kind of got pushed back a week. Yes. Um, okay. So instructional days are essentially the same, I think, uh, versus the current start date. Um, I guess my question is two things. One, is, is this enough time? You know, I mean, pushing it back, does it a really aid in the preparation for the teachers? Chris, you mentioned kind of a supply chain issue. Um, I hate to, I hate to keep, you know, pushing things back and consequently going further into June, but, but the chances of us having in-person instructional opportunities in June are greater than what we're going to obviously start the year with uh, in a virtual setting. Is that, are there are there considerations as to how to, you know, uh, I, I think the hope would be by the end of the year, right? We're we're ideally in twenty in the middle of twenty twenty one. I don't know. We can't predict this, but more in person instruction is is actually happening. Um, what what are what are some of the considerations that have been sort of talked through from an administration standpoint around those points? Any anything that you want to add to that? Well, I think that we're trying to figure out uh, the, the time we're trying to buy is to get the folks prepared to assist the teachers when they come on site. So uh, making sure that we've got, we've spent so much time doing planning and looking at layers of, of protection and making sure our tiers are correct and reading guidance. Um, and we have been preparing for virtual, but now we have to do some very specific heavy lifting to prepare for the teachers to come back. So uh, from the principals meeting today, and for those of you that were there, I think what we heard was they were very grateful to have the week. It will, have, it will allow them to do some small group work with some folks that will allow uh, the things to happen as they should when the teachers come back. So I think that is why we landed on a week. The other thing is we're looking at the other end. So uh, I did talk to the construction folks to make sure that, you know, we weren't ending up with anything that would 
be deal breakers in terms of their plans. And, you know, we've got window replacement and things like that. They assured me that they could work with a week or two weeks. Um, but we also start getting into issues if we want to have summer programming. So we, I, a week seemed like uh, it would buy us some time, but would not fundamentally alter what we need to do on the back end of that as well. Right. It's a good compromise. Any other questions? Okay, so moving on to the next item um, for discussion and also a decision that needs to be made um, regarding our preschool program. And it seems to be kind of where we all are in the region. I've talked to several superintendents and boards are all trying to decide if they'll have preschool open um, to their to their students and families considering where we are right now um, with our tier three and how to conduct our learning virtually or not so we have considerations here regarding enrollment uh, virtual learning and also what layers of protection looks like in terms of the preschool and what we have in place around that planning. So enrollment really, since this is a fee-based program, is really around financial impact. So just to be clear there, and I'll have Chris start us off with giving you the context and considerations for your decision this evening. Okay, so uh, we spoke at the last board meeting um, in general terms as to what uh, an extended closure would be if we were if we needed to cancel these fee based services. So speaking directly this evening to the preschool program, the preschool program is budgeted for the for the 2020 21 school year to collect. Let's see here. I don't want to say this number wrong. We've budgeted for about $522,000 of revenue. So obviously um, that number would scale lower if, uh, if, we, if we started up preschool and wherever we closed it, that, that number would scale to, to that space of time. Um, we're also planning on collecting basic formula money uh, claiming a certain portion of our preschool kids for in the foundation formula for ADA, average daily attendance. So that would be for a closure for the full year, that would be another loss of $34,500 in revenue. So all in, we're right around that $555,000, $560,000 mark on the, the lost revenue. Now, uh, on the other side is the, the teacher side. We we choose as a district to hire certified teachers as our lead preschool teachers, which is uh, a phenomenal thing to do. Uh, it's the best thing to do for our kids. Um, however, while without the preschool program, those teachers, we will need to reallocate them within the district. And I can let Roxanna speak more to the staffing aspects of that. But so, uh, Along with that loss in revenue, there is also no decrease in the expenditures as it relates to the program, other than on the supplies side. And that's, that's it on the financial side there. Okay. And so, uh, Roxana, you want to just continue there? You might want to speak to the um, staffing and then lead into the virtual piece. Sure. So uh, I would say I've spent quite a lot of time talking to Cindy and the and, and the leadership at ECC in terms of preschool. And I, I will tell you that we are torn uh, because we know that, um, you know, high quality educational opportunities for very young children is a community need. And we also know that uh, most families back up when that is not available through us is with grandparents and other relatives. And we also know that uh, a lot of folks who are in high risk categories are typically the backup caregivers. And so we are hearing from uh, all quarters that, you know, child care is of critical need, particularly for first responders and particularly for, you know, single parents and families. So 
um, you know, one of the things that Cindy has asked us to consider. And so I'm going to present two kind of different, differing views. One is with everyone else out of the building and the fact that most families will, will uh, have some means to keep children home. One view is we should attempt to keep the preschool open in some capacity and try to spread that across the building, which would give us a lot more community spread and do our very best to assist the families who have no other, other recourse. So that is one proposal that's on the table tonight that has merit simply because we know it's a community need. Um, so if, if we were to go that route, uh, we would use whatever of our preschool staffing, we'd have to designate them as essential workers according to their job description. Um, we, would, we would bring them in to, to get you know, that ratio that, that we believe is a, a safe ratio, which would obviously be a very small number of children spread throughout the building following all the safety measures. If we choose not to, if we say that you know, we want to close the preschool, um, then all of the preschool staff would be reallocated to K1 and 2. Um, we would be using them to run small groups and to make sure that we have as much direct virtual instruction as we can because we know that children in very early grade levels have a really hard time in distance learning without the additional support. So we have a plan for both. It really is, um, and both, bro both are priority needs. Um, and so I ask, you know, which, which way should we advocate? And depending on how you look at it, uh, honestly, we can make a case either way. Um, at this point, um, we don't, honestly, I, I, um, we're prepared to do, we're, we're prepared to do either, really depending on the board's comfort level. Um, we know that, you know, we have received throughout the summer uh, requests that as much, many child care facilities remain open as they can. We do have some uh, staffing need that we could reallocate that staff and actually use it for our school age kids and we don't have to provide preschool. Um, the, other, the other piece of that uh, is that um, that means we likely would not be providing any free preschool services because they're fee-based. We could offer some virtual preschool options in a very limited format for folks. Um, you ask me later, I can talk about the all virtual option. If we did have some folks interested in that, the product that we are intending to use does have a preschool option. However, it's not something that's going to serve to keep the child occupied in front of a screen for many hours a day, because that's not appropriate. It really is just enrichment pieces uh, to try to keep some kids moving forward with some educational opportunity. Thank you, Chris and Roxana. So are there any questions about some of the background here for the preschool and where we are right now in tier three, entering into tier three? I, I have a question, Karen. Is it, is it possible um, that, I guess let me back up and make sure I understand what's being asked. Like are, are you all asking the board to make a decision on whether we you know, shut down preschool for the semester, for the whole year? And then I think when you answer that, then I can, I can follow up with another question. I can be clear on my second question. Well, like, really what I'm asking you all to decide is we're now entering into tier three for the district and we are going to monitor community spread. We did not put a timeline on that because we want to monitor it. So it would, we need to know, okay, now that we have this program, do you want to have this fee-based program going on or not during the same time frame? I mean, you could, it's a choice, honestly. If you want, because it is fee-based, it could operate a different timeline if you want, but right now, typically families have considered preschool starting around about the same time, and we need to make a decision and let families know and then also we need to let our staff know what what are we doing with our program i, I understand that so then my second question i'm just going to ask it then my second question is is it possible while we are while you all are monitoring um the spread 
to determine whether or not we would be able to get back into the buildings, couldn't we do that for preschool as well? Yeah, you could if you want. Um, but also, this is a different beast. And then I'll let Chris and also Roxanne, because it's fee-based, we, we have to and think about how we repurpose staff and how we have to plan in terms of what money we may, if we close, how will the financial impact uh, hit the budget? So, because Chris, I don't know if you've thought about that in timelines, like what would be the best recommendation for that? If the, like the least impact on that? And I well, guess- I, I guess the question really is, is do we open preschool? Um, you know, we've, the, the virtual option uh, was discussed for K through six, but this being a fee-based service um, and with childcare being such an important aspect of, uh, in, in the region actually, um, the question is, do we open? Um, beyond that, uh, you know, the, the numbers, the numbers that we discussed at the last meeting, um, essentially if we shut down, if we were to shut down everything, fee-based services included, that immediately drops our operating fund balance uh, from the budgeted 38% to 35%. Shutting it down for the year takes us down to right around 32%. Um, of course, and we, we can slice and dice that based on which services stay and which services go. Uh, but that is, that is the financial impact. And I, 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 you know, obviously the financial impact is what it is. I think this is really a decision about, um, you know, our value that we've had all along about providing a critical service to the community in terms of childcare for families that don't have it versus weighing the safety of saying that, you know, everyone has to stay out of the building and th that's really what it comes down to. We have two competing values and, and, and Cindy, I see you there. Uh, I don't know if you would like to weigh in with your opinion, but I know that we've been torn as we've been discussing this issue. Um, I know Chris, can Cindy, she can't, does she have a link? Yes, she's here. Okay. I didn't realize I was actually, I mean, I've been listening, but I didn't realize I was actually, um, on. So I think Roxana did an excellent job of representing um, the conversations that we've had and the decisions we've been trying to think through um, regarding preschool. Um, and again, I think that's exactly, I think it's exactly it that the board is, just, is going to have to decide, are we going to open it um, and provide a high quality learning environment for our families with reduced numbers of students um, and creating optimal social distancing um, with lar more space if K-1-2 students are not there. Um, and, you know, virtual learning for um, our preschoolers is definitely not optimal. Um, and so it leaves our families with our young children very limited um, services if we look at virtual learning for them. Um, but we do have a plan, should you decide that we need to close, we do have a plan to repurpose staff as Roxana explained. Um, I'm not sure how much else I can add to that. I can certainly answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Dr. Heaton-Strike. I actually have a question for Chris. Chris, I understand that, you, that you're saying to us that the question is whether we open or not, but really I just wanna get an understanding um, and an answer to my question. And my question is when, when we are looking at K through two for the ECC, right now we're in virtual and we're in virtual because we voted that we needed to be in that space. Now for me, that's the same view that I have for preschool. But what I'm asking is, is it possible for us to continue to monitor what's going on. And then when we see that it's okay for our K through two students to come back in, we also do that for preschool. Instead of just saying, oh, for this semester of preschool, we're not going to have it. Is that a possibility? In my opinion, it absolutely is. Um, I, I don't see why that would be any different. I think uh, we, we would be able to, Cindy, I mean, 
as far as the timeline to get to get the preschool program back online and spun up, uh, I would think that we would be able to do that relatively quickly. We would just, as long as we had a little bit of time to plan for that. Right, and we'd have to, um, in our communication with our preschool families, we would need to let them know that that is a possibility. Um, I, I don't think it would take long if, let's say, you know, October, mid-October, circumstances were such that K-1-2 could come back. I think you're right, probably a week's lead time to, you know, rebalance our classes, assign classes, get that information out to parents would be reasonable. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Dr. Hebenstreit. Just to follow up on the reason why I'm asking that is, if, so with reallocating the um, preschool teachers to assist, I think you all said uh, kindergarten and school grade, mm -hmm. I would think once they go, once we come back into the building, we would need to do something with those teachers. So I'm just thinking they would be able to go back to preschool, so. Right, correct, okay. yes. That's all I have. Thank you, guys. Sure. So um, the team has spent a lot of thought, and I, I want to recognize Cindy and Roxana um, working with Learning Plan. She's Cindy has also done a lot of separate planning for preschool, and it's all very intricate. And thinking about the students, protecting the students, and also capturing all of the staff and um, repurposing and giving them continual work as much as possible as we make this shift, especially now since we're entering tier three. So I want to thank them for really thinking through that. It's just, we need to know moving forward, which way you all would like to go. I do have a question. Mm -hmm. how, how do we protect our staff if we send those kids back to school right now? Well, you know, Brandy, there, the easy, there isn't an easy answer to that, but we, we would do the same things that the daycares that have remained open are doing. We would make sure that we have social distancing. We would make sure we have stable cohort groups. We would make sure that they are wearing masks. We would make sure that there's frequent hand washing and, and on and on with that list. Um, you know, we'd have to have signage. We parents would not be able to enter the building. There's a protocol for meeting kids at the door. So there, there would be very strict protocols in place that Cindy has thought through if we were going to do that. And I know that there's specific guidance. I know from CDC for early child care, um, for daycares and preschools, uh, that's been out for quite a while. They published that information. Yeah, I, I was aware it's been out. It's also changing daily. Yeah, um, I don't know that it even reflects the information that we received, what, just last week in our meeting. Um, another question, too. Have we talked to the teachers um, about how they feel about coming back? Are they, are, what are you hearing? Are they ready? Um, we, I, have I, I have talked to uh, many of the teachers. I will tell you there, is varying, there are varying opinions among our teaching staff. I have heard specifically from a couple of the preschool teachers that have significant concerns. I have heard from others who said they drove around after the board meeting and cried because they want to come back to school. So I, I, I've heard from both sides of the issue, actually. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, one of the layers, again, this is a, more of a personal anecdote, but, you know, my children um, are in a center that reopened on June 1st. Um, they went back a few weeks ago. They've actually been home the past two days because they have runny noses. And we're now in a space where you don't send your kid to school, even with a runny nose. And so, you know, that's the other, like, layer of it's not as though uh, starting up preschool is not going to be disruptive to family. You know, families will continue to need to find um, care for their kids if they're a little under the weather all the way to if, um, you know, God forbid, there's a uh, spread within the, the pre-K program. So, you know, that is 
just another reality of, of um, where we're at right now. I happen to struggle a little bit too with the optics of having part of our school system. I mean, I know preschool is a paid service. It's not officially part of the district in that sense, but that's not the perception that's going to be out there amongst the great many parents that we just told they can't send their elementary school aged, high school aged, and middle school aged kids to school. I just don't see politically or even in reality how we make how we make a preschool reality safe where we weren't sure that the safety would be there for the elementary school kids. I don't I don't get it. It's also very um, uh, heartening to hear about the option to redeploy preschool teachers to support our K-1, maybe two students. Um, I think, you know, we obviously recognize that it's not just some magical switch that flips in kindergarten that suddenly virtual learning is, is easy, right? Um, and so, um, I think a lot of the feedback heard um, about what was challenging around the K-1-2 uh, virtual experiences in the spring was, um, you know, the size of groups um, and um, the, the um, limited amount of direct interaction with teachers. And so um, as we think about kiddos that we want um, getting on, you know, a good foot um, into their academic, um, you know, career with us. Um, I am, I know, again, this, it will take some heroics by our, our pre-K teachers to sort of, you know, wrap their minds around some different um, orientations to teaching, but um, that sounds very promising to me that we would be able to provide not just high levels of support, but even extra levels of support for um, those children in the virtual environment. And then when it is safe to return to um, the buildings in the future that there, we, we still have those uh, pre-K pre teachers who um, could, could shift to being, uh, you know, over their own cohort of students again too. What are the hours of preschool? It's um, eight to three o'clock. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm inclined to um, agree with Wes's assessment there that I think it's sending an inconsistent message that how you all decided to move forward last week is not directly how you would decide to move forward with pre-K. Um, but I also would think that I would be in favor of opening pre-K as soon as we can migrate into a tier two model when deemed safe rather than waiting until a semester break, if at all possible. Um, and I agree with Katie along the lines of, you know, the importance of trying to utilize the expertise of our pre-K staff to help our other staff during the virtual model. Um, that's just my two cents with it. Any other questions? Okay. So Katie, if you like, you want us to move on to tier three updates? Okay, so in this section, um, I know you were inquiring, like, what are the three pathways for virtual as a recap? So, uh, Roxana, if you could, before we get started with the other updates, could you share where we are with those three pathways to recap? Sure. Um, so, what we have tried to do, as have other districts throughout the region, is try to take care of families and give them some level of, of of security and choice. So we have, you've seen our tiered model, right? Where we have three tiers based on community conditions. Uh, we believe that 
the majority of MRH students will follow our tiered model uh, and that they are, uh, will start virtual. And then if community conditions improve, and we hope they do, at some point in the fall, we would be migrating back into a tier two, which is some time on site for students. Uh, and again, depending on community conditions will dictate how many students and, and how much you know, social distancing we need and how much room. Uh, and so for those students, they will be working uh, in its learning with um, MRH teachers and MRH MRH curriculum as they normally would. Uh, and the idea is that they're getting a blended learning experience. So they're working through the It's Learning platform. They're getting a lot of face-to-face -face time with MRH teachers and they intend on being on campus with us when it is safe to do so. We also uh, know from uh, just putting out our surveys and for pieces throughout the region that we do have a group of, of families uh, for a wide variety of reasons, either because of the health of the child, the health of family members in the home, that they do not want to come on campus at all for first semester um, and perhaps longer. Um, and so we um, obviously want to keep MRH students enrolled at MRH and connected to us. We want them to be able to access our food programs. We want them to be able to access our social emotional health. But we also know uh, that if we come back on campus and we're operating in a blended It's Learning format, that just leaving them with whatever resources we have in blended is not sufficient to make sure that they continue to learn. So uh, we've had virtual options uh, in the past before. And so we have been looking for uh, all virtual vendors. So for families that would choose a virtual only option, uh, we have found some platforms that are designed for year long virtual learning. Uh, in grades K through six, we have the staffing and we feel very confident that we can staff that virtual platform with MRH teachers so they can get face time with our teachers and we can keep them moving along in parallel with our curricula. Uh, the advantage of being in the all virtual platform is it really is designed for programmers to do some things that as wonderful as our teachers are, they, they can't do in a virtual space. So there's interactive games, there's assessment features, there, there are things that, that we just need if they're never coming on campus. At the secondary level, uh, I've been meeting with the secondary principals and secondary teachers as much as possible. We would like to try to keep them with MRH teachers, but there are so many certifications and so many course options and our staffing is so lean in some departments uh, that we're just not sure if it's humanly possible to do that or if it would be humane to do that to teachers who would already be uh, tapped out. So in the secondary, uh, we will be working with counselors and families to try to replicate their schedule uh, with a variety of vendors potentially. Um, again, if we can get a large enough group and we can make a virtual section of an MRH class, we would want to do that, but we certainly cannot guarantee it just based on the wide variety of courses and the wide variety of course spread. So what we're really telling parents is they have three options, essentially. They can be part of the MRH tiers plan, knowing that as community conditions allow, uh, we'll either be virtual or back on campus blended. Um, and if some miracle were to occur, perhaps we would be in a tier one, but we're really thinking it will be tier two to tier three, and we may go in and out of that, depending on you know, what is happening. If, if you don't want your child to come back on campus for this semester, then you have an all virtual option, and we would encourage you to sign up for that option because the continuity of instruction is built for learning in an extended all virtual format. Um, again, we will try our best to figure out the staffing model to staff with MRH teachers, but we cannot guarantee that at a secondary level for the reasons that I've explained. The third option we really hope families don't take, but they do have the option, and that is to disenroll from MRH and then, you know, provide their own educational experience either through homeschooling or some other private option. Um, so we're, we're trying to, uh, I, I will explain all of that in a recording that I will put out. There is a form that we will ask folks for each child to go ahead and fill out that express their preference. And as part of that form, it will clearly say that if you're taking the all virtual model or you're taking the homeschool model, there will be additional paperwork that will need to be filled out in conjunction 
uh, with the counselors at the school because we want to make sure that that virtual fit uh, works for families and they understand exactly what that will look like. I hope that answered your question, but I'm always happy to, to answer more if you've got additional questions. So from the perspective of staff, then, it sounds like from K to six, we have enough current MRH teachers who um, would be agreeing to teach in a blended environment and enough MRH teachers who would be agreeing to teach in a full semester virtual environment at this point. Obviously, we don't know exactly what numbers look like. Correct. Um, that likely could disrupt loops as they have previously been assigned, but uh, the MRH experience by an MRH teacher would be guaranteed. That's what we, that, I, I, again, I, I hate to use the word yeah. guarantee until we see the number. Right. Yes. yes. Based on our polling and based on, you know, uh, anecdotal request, we believe that to be true. Yeah. And then in the middle school, high school spaces, we are um, assuming we have the MRH staff to teach in a blended environment and that uh, we will try to accommodate uh, fully virtual specific courses, um, but uh, may need to tap into some of those other platforms that would come with their own teacher for a specific topic. Um, Correct. And if we did that, of, of course, MRH staff is still available for questions. Our counseling services are still available. Our social emotional services are still available, mm -hmm. but um, we may not, for example, I'll just use this. Let's say that we have AP physics and we have one or two AP physics students that want to take it virtual. We can't disband our AP physics class and we can't really expect a teacher who has five preps to then teach those five preps in two or three yeah. different formats. Yeah. So in that situation, we might have to outsource someone. And that's just an example. We won't know right. until we right. see who the kids are and what their schedules look like. Well, and frankly, every year we have a couple of students who pick, you know, who want to take a class that we don't offer at MRH and do, you know, not new class, <laughs> right. Uh, right? So that it wouldn't be unusual necessarily. Um, from, Correct. Okay. Um, great. Um, and we, I mean, this asking you to put your HR hat on, Roxana. Okay. Um, the um, at this point, we think that we have, do we think that we have some teachers who must teach in an all virtual environment um, because of their own concerns? Uh, we, we have a handful of teachers who have had their doctors uh, send letters saying that it would be preferred for them to, but also gave us other things that could be done if that was not an option. So I do not currently have anyone that I would say must, but I do have a handful of folks who it would be preferred. Um, and so the plan would be, as soon as we know how many sections at K through six, we would post those positions with anyone who has a health concern getting priority. And then if we place those folks and we have more people than we have positions, we would interview for those positions. Obviously, if no one signs up for those positions, then we may have to reassign staff um, and that, you know, there's a process for that as well. At the secondary level, uh, it's a little more complicated. <laughs> and so what we, part of, part of why we need the extra week, even though it doesn't sound like much of a thing, is if we have to go back and look at schedules to reconvene some schedules so that we get kids clustered in a virtual section. Um, we have some Blue Devil Center time already built in. Um, and so all of that can work, but we get in a real bind because certifications matter at the secondary level. So I might have a teacher available with time, but they might not have the right certification for the groups that we have, which is, those are the scenarios by which we would go out then and try to 
uh, not only purchase access to the course, but purchase the instructor to lead that course access if we, if we can't get our schedule to line up in a very small district with a lot of electives that we offer. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I guess the other thing I could say is one potential we talked about this morning and I don't know, we won't know if we need to use it. Uh, if we had a large number of students needing similar coursework, we could also outsource that by, by hiring part-time instructors. Um, so it just, until we see schedules, I, I won't know how to tell you what's the best way to go. So we're hoping to start um, getting parents enrolling or making choices probably next week. And that'll be through the Google. Google. So I would, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Karen. I would like to have the information available this week. The building plans will come out on August 1st. We would then give them um, a week or so to go ahead and start telling us their prelim their choices. So that would give us about three weeks to work with them to complete schedules and do enrollment for anyone who wants the all virtual option. Yeah, and just uh, to emphasize the building level plans are going to be released on August 3rd on Monday. And so the information that Roxana is going to have out is the end of this week. So just to let you know, we have these things coming. Any other questions? So also planning for tier three, um, there's these uh, ideas that have been discussed quite a bit um, with staff and then also some um, ideas to support students to have a uh, small group intervention groups um, again on site. The first thing to really just let you know that there has been some thought around staff um, to come in, of course, with social distancing and with checking in with health checks, wearing masks, but coming into their space so they can conduct their virtual teaching. Um, the thinking is that they would have access to their supplies. They would have, if they're going to do things that are synchronous, they have their whiteboards, they have all their other um, teaching supplies available. It would not be uh, required. It would be optional for the very things, kind of Katie, you were talking a moment ago, if they have medical concerns, um, they would be welcome to you know, stay home just to let us know. But I know there has been some discussion among staff and administrators that in order to be effective with virtual instruction, they need to be around their tools for their, you know, tools of their craft. So that's what that piece is. And I know, uh, Nikki, you wanted to have some discussion around that last time we met. Are you talking about when we were discussing like porch visits and that? Um, Are we talking about teachers going back into the building? Yeah, yeah. It wasn't that uh, innovation around that piece. It was around what I'm talking about right now. I think you said you wanted to have a conversation. I said, oh, that's coming next week. I think you said you had some questions. I can't remember them, Karen. I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's all right. I, I would just I would just add that, that you know uh, talking okay. with, talking with the groups that are the virtual instruction coaches, uh, it's going to be necessary for staff to to be in the buildings at least periodically. We can't replicate lab experiments. We our swivel cameras that they need to. I mean that we just have a lot of tools uh, that it would be uh, much safer and much more efficient to use if if they were in the building. It also does give us the added benefit that when we're here, we're practicing a lot of the social distancing guidelines and getting some folks used to, to what that environment looks like. So, um, you know, making it optional does give us also some leeway for, you know, staff members who have various, uh, everybody, everybody has conditions and we've got folks that will be in and out, but um, we just wanted to let you know that we will uh, be honoring the request to have staff in the buildings, but while we're here, we will also be following all those guidelines we've put in place. Yes. 
So um, that then leads us to this uh, innovation around small group um, intervention groups or social pods or what have you. I sat in, I think Brandy, you were there as well, that came up in the um, SSD Zoom conversation. And I know uh, several families were talking about that and inquiring about opportunities for the students to come, of course, with all the layers of protection, with staffing that felt comfortable um, coming on site, but to have that contact with certain groups of students and just, I don't know, and I've had staff also inquire about that possibility as well. So I wanted to put that out for you all to know that we really feel strongly about giving this opportunity, but I mean, if you all have some thoughts and some feelings, you know, I want us to be on the same page with that. So this would be like the idea of kids who need occupational therapy being able yeah. to come to the school building to teach things yeah. like yeah. that. Okay. That seems to make sense as far as there's no other way for those kids to get services. Essentially, yes. In an effective way, you know, yeah. I can't, I guess you could try and do it, but it, it really would not be helpful. Um, I think that that is, given the, the nature of the students, uh, their requirements for that more face-to-face -face interaction, that's definitely supportable. I wonder if we want to put a cap on the, I mean, say no greater groups than 10 or 15 or I don't know, eight. I, I don't think that's a problem. <laughs> I think we're probably fewer than five, probably yeah. two or three, Vince. Yeah, so the, the issue of therapies came up um, in terms of what we did in the spring. There were some limitations on what was that was possible virtually at the time. Now, <clears throat> SSD has reworked that, so they, they can do more now virtually. So there are options to do, you know, tele speech therapy and OT and all this stuff, but it's certainly better, especially with younger students, to do that in person. So that's one group. But the issue of students on site and small intervention group also came up in, in broader areas besides the therapies. More uh, kids who are working on social emotional goals, um, EL, first year learners that don't know any English. I mean, there's a kind of a menu that we could consider, not pushing it, but that's, those are the things that have come up. Um, it's almost like a tier 2.5, you know, if you will. Um, where uh, we, we would provide limited small group uh, instruction in a safe way for students to have documented uh, needs that are um, exceptional. And um, this is something that's come up that other schools are kind of tinkering with nationally, I would say, and it's come up with some of our parents. So it's just something that we wanted to put out there to consider. <clears throat> uh, yeah, Vince, I mean, I know in some of the conversations I've been having in my day job too, that there are some limitations for beha for behavioral telehealth. Yeah. Um, you know, especially I think some of our older students having privacy for those appointments. Right. I mean, that's mm -hmm. something that I would like to see a plan, you know, created. Could we provide, you know, telehealth booths, you know, for kids who can't get um, privacy, privacy time at home and who really need to continue to see a counselor or a therapist. Yeah. yeah. Can, I, I'd like to ask Brandy, Brandy, forgive me for putting you on the spot. I want to, I want to hear your views on this, please. Um, well, as you guys know, I do have kids with special needs and occupational therapy, I think is important. I think that, you know, the services that we can't give um, the kids off campus, we do need to explore how to do that on, but with certain guidelines. Um, my concern is how is it going to be applied? Are the teachers going to are they going to have guidelines that they have to follow making sure like Wes said there's no more than I wouldn't even be comfortable with eight kids I don't know that I'd be comfortable with five I think no more than two or three um and 
what is that going to look like? Um, I do think that we need to get SSD in on that part of the conversation to see what services they now are comfortable feeling that they can provide to the students um, virtually, et cetera. Um, I liked the idea of the porch visits to do some of those things. Um, I think that, ha you know, if that's something that can still be explored, it needs to be. Um, I don't want our kids at risk and I don't want our teachers at risk. Um, part of what makes our district so amazing is our staff. Um, and I want them to know that we, we value them just as much. And so I just want everyone to be safe and us to figure out the ways to do that, but still get these kids the services that they absolutely need. And I, I think um, that's great feedback and coming back after collaborating with uh, Mr. Gleason and us coming up with agreed upon, uh, not necessarily restrictions, but just guidelines on how you engage in the numbers, like what's possible. I'm happy to share that with you. Would you all feel comfortable with hearing more details once we work with SSD and case managers and see what that looks like? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hey, hey, Karen. I'm I'm happy to help with that task. And Ben's been texting me, so he's obviously Is listening. He? <laughs> to, yeah, he yes, but I'm a lousy spokesperson for Ben Gleason, but I'll try my best. Um, yeah, very but, good. Uh, Vince, do you want me to bring him on? Is he online? I don't think he's. I don't think he's lobbying for that. Actually, I don't. I don't no. think <laughs> He's just saying that that's a doable thing, that we can start uh, mocking up what that would look like. Um, yeah, I, th I, th I think the challenge systemically is that um, I think if it's only SSD services in person, it's, it's a tricky thing for SSD to offer in-person services if the rest of our gen ed population is not coming in. So I think it would depend on whether or not we do. We're considering doing these pods for students with disabilities, students with 504s, students with general education interventions like EL, it, it, I think it sort of depends on, the devil's always in the details about whether or not we cast a little bit of a more of a wider net. So he's gonna check on that with leadership, but Karen, I'm happy, happy to help you kind of craft more details about what we're Very thinking good. about this. So what we'll do, we'll create a plan uh, similar to how we stepped everything out for just general education. Now that we're gonna move forward with this idea with intervention groups, we can now then kind of give you those details and the guidance with layers of protection, how mm -hmm. many students, all of that, we'll come back to you with it. Yeah. Yeah. And again, it's sort of like a tier 2.5 that may not happen right away, but as we're seeing numbers go down and we want to kind of stick our toe in the water, we might try this with the intervention groups first and then maybe bring the rest of the students back in. There's, there's a lot of possibilities, but we will we'll help you guys get some more details around who we're talking about, the students we're talking about here. Yeah, very good. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of how I vote, like always in the middle. I never take a stand. Uh, yeah, trying to label everything. I know. Make sense of it. So that's all that I have for the group today. Um, your vote is later on when you're finished with your discussion around the search firms. So. Yeah, I mean, sorry. Uh, yeah, I mean, Karen, if you just want to turn your camera off, I mean, we're we're only gonna this is only gonna take a few minutes. Um, so this isn't um, an in-depth conversation at this point. Okay. Well, can I just leave, or I mean, you want me to? Or if you, <laughs> you. <laughs> did you want me? Did you want me here for the vote? Uh, you don't have to be. That's fine. We can. You can. Okay. All right. Well, bye, everyone. I'm going to stop the share. Bye, Karen. Have a good evening. Bye. Right. Thank you all. Bye. Right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. Oh, apologies. Um, all right. The last agenda item here is uh, the search firm process. <laughs> So um, basically, written here in the um, in the comments, 
Um, so we uh, had a nice turnout with um, seven different firms uh, submitting proposals. Um, admittedly, we had a very aggressive timeline that we're um, slightly behind on at this moment. So um, sharing that, um, I've put together a Google form, um, a PDF of it is attached here. Um, and I was, I'm hopeful that um, all school board members will want to take a look at those proposals, which we can send um, out. Uh, thanks to Chris and Roxana and Francis for participating in the virtual opening um, last week. But um, based on the criteria that was in our RFP, um, the document there is heavily weighting our deliverables um, and more, um, our, uh, um, and then obviously weighting some of the experience um, working with, for, uh, with districts of our type or size. Um, and then uh, some consideration for um, the cost uh, associated. Um, we, uh, I know budgeted at a very high rate and all of the proposals are, are well under the, the astronomical price that I put on there, Chris. So I'm sure you were glad to see, um, <laughs> see that. <laughs> we, um, we, I think need to decide um, what, uh, uh, what, when would we like to have, you know, our own deadline of everybody looking at proposals and providing feedback? Um, we decide um, who's going to be involved. Is this a full board committee or is this a, a smaller group that will do interviews and bring forward some finalists? Um, and um, again, I know this is not something that we've done before and some of the um, devil in the details here, um, just trying to go through. So, um, and also the, the Google form that I've put together, again, that's PDF here, um, is, is totally open for um, improvements too. If, if folks um, are taking a look at that this evening um, and want to suggest any um, alterations to that, I'm fine as well. So, um, I'll pause here, of course, now that the baby has stopped crying, um, to, for any questions or comments that folks might have. So I'll go first. Um, you. you know, I've, I've been through this in a different way um, in the past, and I think that for transparency purposes and for full input of the board, that I think that um, this should be completed by the entire board together throughout the entire process, rather than assigning it to a specific committee. Um, this is the one thing we have to get 100% on board with in the selection of the committee, and then obviously the you know the subsequent selection. So. My recommendation is this, I mean, there's seven of us. Um, we can come to a consensus. We've got a good tool for evaluation. We should work on this together as a, as a full board. We owe it to the staff, the community, the families to, to do this. This is the big, one of the biggest decisions we'll be making moving forward. I agree with that. A plus one from Wes and Brandy, great. <laughs> Thank you. I agree also with Maria. Right. Hey, Francis shaking his head. So yeah, I'm on board. Great. Um, so then um, assigning homework then for our team um, of, of the full board, um, is it reasonable for folks to review these seven proposals? Um, and again, I think using this tool to kind of input your feedback on each one of them would be the ideal um, by, you know, next week, we probably will need to set yet another um, meet work session to, um, you know, work through our, um, uh, our ratings and, and ultimately um, decide who we're going to bring in for interviews. So um, I believe that we would be slated to have a work session um, 
sometime next week in kind of our rhythm of work sessions. I think if we were going to start moving to the first Thursday of the month, that actually would be um, August 6th. Um, so is it reasonable to have folks review each of these proposals and provide feedback by um, next week, Wednesday, so that we could meet next Thursday and come to a consensus on who we'd like to interview? I think that's reasonable. Yep. Three thumbs up. Thank you, Wes. Okay, great. Um, so following this meeting, we'll get out um, both the Google form and the, um, the compiled um, proposals for folks. Um, Chris, I know that there was one uh, blank document in the what was submitted and I just received the, um, the actual document from that uh, group. I figure we would give them the opportunity to for real submit their information as opposed to an oops um, submitting their their yes uh, so you did get it I was getting ready to forward it to you I, I did yeah yeah okay. thank you um, so um, so great we'll do that um, I will communicate with all the firms that our timeline is slowed down slightly but that we um, have received their information and are reviewing it um, oh. and then we'll set a time to to do interviews um, great uh, Katie are we going to, uh, on the six, could we also look at your, the timeline that we had out and just make kind of revisions as a board as I necessary? Think that, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I would love to have um, uh, a final selection to, you know, affirm at the regular August board meeting. But, you know, again, recognizing we're in COVID times right now that um, and that we were fairly aggressive with our timeline too. Um, just, I think, as long as we're uh, fairly transparent with our possible um, consultants that um, I don't have a problem pushing the timeline a little bit um, and and that's what it's all about so um, great that I think is really all I wanted to make sure that we discussed um, recognizing that um, there will be homework I think some of the proposals are fairly succinct and some of them have many attachments in our close to 50 pages. So just, you know, take a look at, at the whole package when, uh, when it comes to you in email and make sure that um, you give yourself some time to do, to do the assignment. So um, we'll plan to reconvene um, on this topic next week, Thursday. With that, uh, I guess we can move into action items then. All right, so first item on delaying the start of school. I move to delay the start of the fiscal year 21 school year to September 1st, 2020 for grades K through 12. Thank you, Brandy. Thank you, Nikki. Uh, any, any discussion or questions to clarify that are, if uh. anything's necessary, I just, again, wanna make sure we're not plowing through here if we don't want to. All right, hearing none, then um, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes. Uh, preschool reentry. Uh, I need a little conversation on this as to exactly what the proposal is. Yeah, so, um, and that's, I, if, we're, if we were strictly following Robert's rules, I guess we would make a, and we would discuss it, but I'm fine with discussing here which of the two, I think we, we have been presented, there is the option to um, uh, suspend our preschool while we are in the virtual environment, um, and there is the proposal to open only our preschool while K-12 is in a virtual environment. Um, and yeah, I um, am happy to hear folks' uh, thoughts. I know obviously Maria and Wes um, have expressed um, some of the concerns about at least one of those proposals. Um, I do have a question. So would that be suspended for a whole semester? Is that, okay. When will it be suspended till? 
it, it would follow the same schedule as your K-12 students. So whenever everyone else comes back into a tier two, we would want to bring the preschool back into a tier two. Okay. So I, I do have one question, which I, I probably should have asked a few minutes, a, a little bit ago. So I apologize for this. Um, if we're, when we're conceiving the idea of a preschool opening, um, would we be spreading them out throughout all of our buildings or would they occupy generally the spaces they used to occupy for preschool? So Cindy's plan had them throughout the ECC. So they would use our preschool space, but because we would not have other folks in the rest of the building, we would be able to spread them throughout kindergarten spaces um, elsewhere in the building with the idea of having very, very small uh, class sizes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Are we ready for a motion? Any, yeah, any other? Thing. Oh. Yeah, I've just got one thing, and it's it's the moving target, which I know I, you guys are probably sick of me saying, um, but Chris, um, we're really going to need some doubling down on that moving target of the impact of revenue with the delay of the start. Um, so I'm not asking for anything right now. I'm just like trying to wrap my brain around, I know what you said, the potential fund balance decrease could be without it, but that might not be... Let's hope that's not the worst case scenario. Um, so if you can just kind of keep us abreast as this moves along as we're in two weeks and hopefully not months, um, what that impact would have on us. Does that make sense? It does. And I've, as this meeting's progressed, I have some ideas on how I think I will present that to you on a month to month basis uh, as part of the financial statements. I mean, I, I, it doesn't necessarily need to be overt, but uh, as we adjust, the revenues as the as the outage extends or not we will adjust our revenue budget accordingly and that will give us a that will give us a true look at your fund balance from month month over month yeah i would i would second that but just to be clear it's the delay of the school year isn't as impactful as the virtual tier that we're going into as far as our budgetary impact correct they're correct. they're really there's a, almost a no budgetary impact of going back a week. No, because we're moving, we're moving the whole calendar right. forward as a, as okay. a unit and not adding teacher contract days. That's where it would start to get expensive and impactful to the budget. But obviously the tier three, what we're going into has clear effects on our revenue programs and uh, other budgetary impacts. Correct. Thank you. Okay. Discovered. And I'm not, preschool. you know, I guess monthly probably is the most appropriate channel for that rather than, I almost wish we could do it weekly, but I will not do that to you. I swear. I swear. Um, you. <laughs> but, you know, maybe we start off monthly and then hope. You know what I can do, Maria, is I, I can, I can work up, I can work up um, what the projected uh, loss would be week to week, month to month, you know, that's, that's just a, that's a pretty simple calculation that we can work up for you. Okay, let's just start with month to month. Okay. Okay, thank you. All right, um, then a motion on preschool. I move to suspend on-site learning for preschool students and staff as presented. Second. Thank you, Brandy and Wes. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, so we are suspending that. Um, and Nikki, I'm not sure if you're. <laughs> she froze. <laughs> I'm here. Can you hear me? Great. We can hear you. Yeah. And, and I voted in favor of that motion. Thank you. Um, anything else for the good of the cause this evening? And I'll take a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. 
Thank you, Wes and Brandy. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right. Thanks, all. Um, Thank you. Good evening. Good night, everyone. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye. -bye. Bye.